breakfast to all of Europe, Asia, everybody, but I did it five minutes before we began. So that's everybody had a chance to think about it. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, today, Jordan and I are going to read and do a commentary uh, or begin, I should say begin, uh, of Answer to Job. And Answer to Job is uh, C.G. Young's most controversial book, I, I suppose, but also the one in which he put himself into it. Mm -hmm. And told us exactly what he thinks. And so, or maybe not exactly what he thinks, because it did get edited, <laughs> even by him, as uh, this little prelude will, will attest. But um, anyway, I read this book to the public in 2016. I think it's high time we did it again. When I read it before, I just wrote it, read it straight out. You can find that entire reading under a playlist called Answer to Job on uh, this YouTube channel. But um, today I wanted to begin with my friend Jordan Hoggard, uh, a, a detailed reading and a commentary on it. And uh, I'm reading from this version, um, which is uh, the 50th anniversary uh, edition of the book. Um, and I want to start with, uh, with a the forward to the 2010 edition, so to uh, put it in context. And so, uh, good morning, Art. You're up early. <laughs> We're off and running. Um, you know, as a sidebar, Skip, one thing oh, yeah. I've always wondered, this is, you know, directly related to Job, I mean, his work. Right. But on a, he, he rarely mixed his personal with his professional, Jung. Mm -hmm. um, but part of me has always wondered if this was kind of a narrative play that sticks to the biblical theme, but is also a literally narrative novel in a way of what would have happened to him if he would have actually gone against the church and actually come out that you need to substitute and change. Oh, it <laughs> you know, it would have knelt him in ashes in a way. Yeah, actually, he would have ended up at, uh, at the stake if he had written this 300 years before, perhaps. And right. uh, e even so, um, he got a lot of criticism about it. But nonetheless, uh, I now believe it to be true. In other words, his perspective of what God is, how we interact with God, and uh, all those things, um, mm -hmm. everything that I know from my own experience relates to back to Dr. Young's teachings, and especially as summed up here. Um, so I want to first read um, uh, just two pages of the forward. Uh, Jordan doesn't have the 50th edition handy, so uh, I'm just going to read this straight through. And Jordan, um, this is two pages after which uh, I'll give you a commentary. <clears throat> and then I'm going to read Jung's prefatory note. Right. Okay. Okay. Nope. So... And at that point, I'll, I'll have the book in front of me. Uh, Once we begin into no, his... No, no, yeah, I don't... Well, maybe you will. Yeah, the prefatory note is in there. Okay. All right. So let me uh, read the forward to the 2010 edition. And I'm, I'm only going to read a portion of it, which is Answer to Job. On 29 May 1951... Jung wrote to Agnella Jaffe from his tower in Bollingen. I have landed the great whale. I mean, answer to Job. Shortly thereafter, Shimena Roelli wrote to her mother, Carrie Baines, quote, 
there is a kind of theological tract he, Jung, has been writing called Antwerp auf Job, Answer to Job, in which CG says Job was right and put a lot of good questions and Yahweh should have answered them. Uh, Mary, Mary MJ, Mary Jane, Mary Jean Schmidt, who was his secretary, said when she typed the first version of this manuscript, the Protestant pastors in her ancestry rose in revolt and she had a terrible time of it. Evidently, it was very violent and blasphemous in tone, very negative toward Christianity. She was most upset. He, he has now toned it down and she thinks before he is ready to publish it, he may do some more. Okay. So this was an interview with uh, Marie Jean Schmidt, who was his secretary. Uh, well, and she was no dummy. So for her to have that kind of response and in a sense stick through her own trial to stay the course is impressive enough also. Sure, and, and she was very, she was with Jung for like 30 years. So, mm -hmm. uh, so for her to be reacting in that way is quite powerful. Okay. Um, as Marie-Louise von Franz recalled, Jung wrote in one burst of energy with strong emotion during an illness and after a high fever. And when he finished, he felt well again. And quote. Uh, he later remarked to von Franz that he would like to rewrite all of his books except Answer to Job. He would leave that one just as it stands. In his prefatory note, Jung wrote that he had been occupied with the central problem of the book for years. No wonder, for it was in Answer to Job that the theology first articulated in Liber Novus, that's the Red Book. Uh, the themes of the progressive incarnation of the God, the necessity for Christification, and the replacement of the one-sided Christian God image with one that encompassed evil within it, found its uh, definitive expression and elaboration. In Jung's fantasies during World War I, a new God had been born in his soul, the God who is the son of the frogs, the son of the earth, Abraxas. Quote, Abraxas is the God who is difficult to grasp. His power is greatest because man does not see it. From the sun, he draws the summum bonum, from the devil, the inf infinum malum. But from Abraxas, life, altogether indefinite, the mother of good and evil. End quote. Jung saw this figure as representing the uniting of the Christian God with Satan, and hence as depicting the transformation of the Western God image. Quote, I understood that the new God would be in the relative. If the God is absolute beauty and absolute goodness, how should he encompass the fullness of life, which is beautiful and hateful, good and evil? laughable and serious, human and inhuman. How can man live in the womb of the God if the Godhead himself attends only to one half of him? Answer to Job is faithful to the force of Jung's theophany, now presented in the form of psychological and historical argument. On November 25th, 1953, Jung wrote to Richard Hall, that, quote, the clouds of dust it has raised at times nearly suffocated me, unquote. Uh, to this day, the controversies around this work have not been stilled. Now, there's another little, I'm not going to read all the footnotes, but I'm going to read one of them. In her interview with Jean Namesh, Sabi Tauber recalled that her husband, Ignaz Tauber, asked Jung what was the happiest moment for him. CG told of the event sailing, uh, the, told of the uh, 
event sailing on the lake after he had started so hard writing answer to Job that he heard the voice of his father saying, you have done the right thing and I thank you for that, unquote. Jung, Jung's Biographical Archive, page 18, in his interview with Namashi, Ignaz Tauber recalled that once I asked him, what was your most beautiful experience? Jung answered, well, I can answer that immediately. It was, that, it was Sunday, I was sailing on the Obersee. It was about noontime, the sun was completely blue. Uh, the sky was completely blue and I felt slightly fell slightly asleep. And then my father appeared, patted my shoulder and said, you have done it rightly. I thank you. That's from, uh, again, from Young's Biographical Archive, page two. Um, okay. Any comment on that before we go on? Just one that is kind of rattling around in my head is that the root of Abraxas is Abra and not going into Abracadabra, the Abra means the father of many. And so what's interesting to me is that when his own dad, his own father came in there, that's where I'm seeing this rush of personal content in a Jungian intensity where all the inclusive, the father of many um, and an abstract the father of many being specifically related to God and then the father of many not being an abstract and being his own lineage and his own ancestry, all three yeah. of those together. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting to me that the abstract and the concrete come together, come together in a livingly present way. Yeah. Just from, I think the Abra of the Abraxas and Abraxas then being a state rather than a person. Right. And um, I had realized long before I read Answer to Job that uh, Jung had a very serious father complex throughout his life and mm -hmm. that can be recognized in many places um, throughout his uh, oeuvre. But here he, he says it outright, and I think that that's uh, appropriate. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me quickly read the prefatory notes so that we do it from a common uh, I do it from a common section and then we'll get into the beginning here. Okay, okay. The, the suggestion and, and this is Jung himself writing now. The suggestion that I should tell you how answer to Job came to be written sets me a difficult task because the history of this book can hardly be told in a few words. I have been occupied with its central problem for years. Many different sources nourish the stream of its thoughts until one day and after long reflection, the time was ripe to put them into words. The most immediate cause of my writing the book is perhaps to be found in certain problems discussed in my book, Ion, especially the problems of Christ as a symbolic figure and as and of the antagonism Christ Antichrist represented in the traditional zodiac zodiacal symbolism of the two fishes. In connection with the discussion of these problems and of the doctrine of redemption, I criticize the idea of privatio boni as not agreeing with the psychological findings. Psychological experience shows that whatever we call good is balanced by an equally substantial bad or evil. If evil is non-existent, then whatever there is must needs be good. Dogmatically, neither good nor evil can be derived from man since the evil one existed before man as one of the sons of God. The idea of the privatio boni began to play a role in the church only after Mani. Before this heresy, Clement of Rome taught that God rules the world with a right and a left hand, the right being Christ, the left, Satan. Clement's view is clearly monotheistic as it unites the opposites in one God. Later, Christianity, however, is dualistic 
in as much as it splits off one half of the opposites personified in Satan, and he is eternal in his state of damnation. This crucial question of whence evil forms the point of departure for the Christian theory of redemption. It is therefore of prime importance. If Christianity claims to be, mo to be a monotheism, it becomes unavoidable to assume the opposites as being contained in God. But then we are confronted with a major religious problem, the problem of Job. It is the aim of my book to point out its historical evolution since the time of Job down through the centuries to the most recent symbolic phenomena, such as Assumptio Maria, the Assumption of the Virgin Mary into heaven. Moreover, the study of medieval natural philosophy of the greatest importance to psychology made me try to find an answer to the question, what image of God did these old philosophers have? Or rather, how should the symbols which supplement their image of God be understood? All this pointed to a complexio oppositorum and thus recalled again the story of Job to my mind. Job who expected help from, help from God against God. This most peculiar fact presupposes a similar conception of the opposites in God. On the other hand, numerous questions, not only from my patients, but from all over the world, brought up the problem of giving a more complete and explicit answer than I had given in Ion. For many years, I hesitated to do this because I was quite conscious of the probable consequences and knew what a storm would be created, would be raised. But I was gripped by the urgency and difficulty of the problem and was unable to throw it off. Therefore, I found myself obliged to deal with the whole problem, and I did so in the form of describing a personal experience carried by subjective emotions. I deliberately chose this form because I wanted to avoid the impression that I had any idea of announcing an eternal truth. The book does not pretend to be anything but the voice or question of a single individual who hopes or expects to meet with thoughtfulness in the public. Okay, Jordan. Yeah, I, I think especially I will keep it into the complexio oppositorum um, because he's, he's opening that up and then aptly saying the monotheism would then naturally have the dualism integrated within it. But what's interesting is then, of course, the complex of the opposites personally would be then the internal civil war in any given person that the, the answer to Job is, is directly addressing. And, um, and that it is unity, um, except the unity is not all hearts and flowers and a Hallmark card, you know? Yeah, it sure isn't. And um, so I guess we can get right into it. Uh, just for the listening public, Answer to Job is um, contained in volume 11 of the collected works. And for that reason, uh, it does not begin with paragraph one. It begins with paragraph uh, 553 and ends 205 paragraphs later at 758. Um, and so these uh, paragraph numbers are common to the collected works of C.G. Young in all languages. So that when a scholar studying in Greek or Spanish or what have you um, refers to a paragraph, they normally refer to paragraphs in the collected works. And therefore everybody that's reading what they have to say knows what they're talking about. And so we don't use page numbers because page numbers would be different between translations and even between editions. And so the, this is why uh, Answer to Joe begins at paragraph 553. 
in something called Lectorio, Lectori Benevolo, which I take to mean uh, a benevolent lecture. So this would be kind of Jung's personal introduction uh, to, the, to the work itself, which uh, begins at paragraph 560, but we're gonna start at 553. You have that there. I do, and your your biblical um, your biblical biblical acumen and scholarship is better than mine. As we start, it it opens with a quote from two Samuel one twenty six. Could you speak to that? It feels like that gives some context, but I don't think biblically I'm qualified to play the scholarship game with that. Well, I, I don't uh, know what the context is of it. I, I take it to mean that we are all faced with both good and evil, that good and evil do exist in the world, and that evil is indeed a great power. And this, um, uh, this issue that was Jung's bugaboo for most of his life, of uh, the privatio boni, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, that the idea of privatio boni is that um, is the privation of good. Okay, in other words, <laughs> evil is simply the privation of good, and uh, the summum bonum, which came from the Catholic Church, of course was that God is all good. However, uh, after the 20th century, it's impossible to say that any longer because we killed 280 million human beings in the 20th century in wars. And um, I think that Jung attributed that barbarism uh, to the idea that Christianity and religion in general had given religious men the, uh, the attitude that uh, God is an agency, an outside agency that's up there or in some mm -hmm. other place and isn't in me. Right. But, but Jung's position <clears throat> and my position is that God is within all of us and we all have both good and evil within us. We've all done bad things. We don't necessarily want to admit it to ourselves, <laughs> but nonetheless, we have done. And, um, and so we all have to come to grips with that and come to grips with the fact that each of us represents um, a piece of the overall God and um, both good and evil. And this is where, in answer to Job, this is what Egon is doing, is, is making this case that, um, you know, we all have evil within us. Uh, mm -hmm. Evil isn't a, a, a sublimer a subluminary devil that's down under the ground. And, and if we only pray enough, everything will turn out hunky-dory. Uh, Jung is saying, no, it's deep in ourselves and we need to recognize it. Mm -hmm. And with enough maturity, his point about uh, 1 John 4.1, uh, which is, uh, you know, test the spirits, whether they be of God or not. What it means is uh, you're, you're going to have both good and evil ideas in your lifetime. And you have to be mature enough to know the difference and uh, to decide what is right and what is wrong. And um, if, if people start to understand what Jung is talking about and that, that only a psychological perspective on all religions. Um, he was he was an equal opportunity offender in this respect. Um, he mm -hmm. 
he that God is represented by the human being and by our human being as a collective unconscious. And so um, when we look out of our window, uh, we see um, Christ dictum, uh, God is, uh, heaven is spread upon the earth and men do not see it. Um, we have created our own heaven and our own hell. And uh, I was writing to a friend yesterday and talking about um, my own experiences. And I said, well, my first war was Korea, it was the Korean War when I was uh, five years old, just about six years old, um, because uh, my father was stationed in Kodiak, Alaska. And at that time, uh, the Navy was perceiving uh, Kodiak to be a potential um, front line in the Korean War. They didn't know whether the Chinese would try to attack uh, North America and they would have to come through uh, Alaska in some way because uh, equipment in the early 1950s wasn't really good enough to, to do what we can do now in jet planes. And uh, so Kodiak was considered to be a combat zone, basically. And although we never had an attack, thankfully, but we did have air raid warnings. We did have um, blackout curtains on our windows. And we did have um, Marines dug in in the hill in front of my house when we were having an exercise. So um, I was experiencing, you know, what it would be like to be at a, in a country at war, even when I was six years old. And so we need to understand uh, how evil um, manifested in those years and all the war since then. Um, and, uh, and if we don't understand it, uh, we can't resolve the human species to uh, live on this planet that we live on. Uh, well, and that's a, I, I spoke that's a, a lot, so. No, no, that's, I think you made a great segue because um, the Korean War then <clears throat> in Kodiak, I mean, that seems to me to be a precedent, precedent directly related to, let's not let Pearl Harbor happen again. I mean, because the yeah. the whole where did they come in from? Were they so high north that no one was looking? Were they so stealthy and quiet? They just came straight across. There was the whole surprise piece of they just appeared all of a sudden. Well, and people need and, to understand that with the Great Circle route, Kodiak is straight across. Okay, exa exactly, exactly. Right. Kodiak yeah, and, is like halfway between. Uh, the Korean Peninsula, where the Chinese were trying to dominate the Koreans, and we see to what end that was, um, and uh, the United States, the lower 48. Kodiak was yeah. right on a direct line. Yeah, so, right on a direct line, and I think that right. applies then to the um, people not seeing the God cast and spread across the earth, and to me, and this this next statement is not flippant at all. I'm I'm serious, um, in that that you know pointing to the God up there, all, mm -hmm. only being outside, is not only a disconnected disassociation, but it's the adult version of the Santa Claus or Easter Bunny God. You know, it's it's very petitioning petitioning kind of prayer. You know, the prayers typically being. Uh, an appendix to your letter to Santa Claus, mm -hmm. you know, I want, I want, I need this, that, the other, instead of just the breath is prayer, which is then within nourishing and a life affirming spirituality kind of God, that that's within and outside. And that connection of both. And I think is important. And I think there's a, there's a context there that then that Kodiak is right on the line. So yeah. it's not looking up from the road. I mean, you yeah. have to you have to account for the direct path 
and then yeah. also include the other indirect paths. Yeah, so, lots, of, lots of things are not what they seem. And if we, right. if any of us look at a map, um, we may think that Kodiak is way up there, way up north and uh, far from the U.S. So why was Kodiak? Uh, the front line, but the answer is all you have to do is take a string to a globe and right. and hold one end of the string on Pyongyang and one end of the string on Seattle, and you'll see that the line on that globe goes directly across uh, mm -hmm. that part of the world, across Kodiak, and that's where our naval base was in those days. It's now a Coast Guard base, but nonetheless... That's where the leading naval base of uh, America was. And it was actually a foreign assignment at that time because Alaska was not yet a, a state at that time. Mm -hmm. Joshua says, can't we redefine good in a more complex goodness in regards to God than insist evil is somehow present within divinity? isn't evil derivative from goodness or spoiled goodness to quote C.S. Lewis. Well, C.S. Lewis was trying to be a justifier for Christianity as it has been taught over uh, millennia. And, um, and I guess they, they might be called apologists or something like that, but um, it's, it's not, there, there, there are opposites everywhere in our lives. That's how we get any consciousness. And, um, and so first we have to admit, first we have to examine ourselves and admit that there is evil within us. And if we do that, then we recognize how right Jung really was. And, and, um, that there is a living God, okay? Nietzsche said that God is dead. God isn't dead, but God is a living God and God lives within us and God lives within our societies and within the human species entirely. And this, is, this was the kind of the good news message of Carl Jung. Nietzsche said, God is dead. Jung came along in the nest next generation and said, no, God isn't dead. Uh, God lives, he said, where he lives and how he goes about doing the work of the Godhead. And unfortunately, the 20th century was a display of how the evil side of God can murder 280 million people to make a point. <laughs> so and, I, and I would add to that directly that that doesn't make Nietzsche wrong. In a linear, yeah. you know, a philosophical if then PQ logic way, sure. Right. But but that's always limited because that's only the line to Kodiak. But right. the indirect lines of context and history make God die at Nietzsche. And even though he's saying the same thing as Jung will in a way, then what happens is then Jung resurrects. So there right. is the life and the birth and the death all in one on account of Right, mm -hmm. and, the, and the God that Nietzsche was referring to is dead, was right. dead the then, and is dead. And that God is the God that the fairy tales say is out there. Um, right. You know, we now have, um, we're about to have the James Webb telescope that look, will look back almost to the Big Bang. And nobody's going to see God up there playing games. And we now can look down to the smallest particle, or we think is the smallest particle, the Higgs boson. <laughs> and, um, and we know that there's no God in the physical world. Um, and the only God in the physical world is the God that's within all of us. So, amen, amen, amen. And so, I let, think so like, let's read answer to Job, though, in fairness. So well, let's go do, ahead. Go really ahead. Quick, yeah, but go ahead really and make, to, make your point. Uh, yeah, one quick point to me, too. There's with that CS, I'm glad Joshua brought that up, the CS Lewis quote, um, because the counterpoint 
point would be Ram Das in the spiritual piece in the early 70s, where we are not, you know, um, living in a material world. Basically, we are spiritual beings living in a body and not. And the thing is, that makes for the separateness again, that makes for a later than Nietzsche, God is dead, where it's a body denial. And instead of being embodied, both and the, the spirit giving life to the matter. And what I find is it works in modern literature, too. There's a concept of appearance versus reality. And that's how novels turn around and sidestep and blindside you, you know, and get that punch of the plot twist. But what's interesting to me was people say appearance versus reality. It's not because the appearance is wrong. The appearance is simply the surface generated by the reality. So they are not separate. The reality is not sneaky, devious, and hidden. The appearance is not some super, superficial fish scale to you know toss off or chaff off the wheat before you make the bread. The appearance and the reality both work together, just like the God within and the body. The body is the appearance. The reality is the divinity. And there is no separateness to me between the two. The surface is generated by the substance. Yeah, we have to live on the bubble between good and evil. And we have to also recognize that there was plenty of evil before the 20th century. I mean, mm -hmm. all, all that burning of people at the stake and all, all the things that were done by the church Um to destroy other people uh, because of my way or the highway, um, you know, that was pretty evil and it's still happening uh, on the earth to this day. And yes. we, we have to understand it. I mean, we, we, we see Putin on the border of Ukraine right now, getting ready to do God knows what. What, what is God going to do there? What's the lesson? That we're if we take the have? Spanish Inquisition, yeah, if we take the Spanish Inquisition, that's a tyranny, an ecumenical tyranny of making some people, it's basically a McCarthyism, and except taken to, it's stuck around for a lot longer. And right now, <clears throat> we, we are starting to see again, the seeds of McCarthyism, the seeds of the Spanish Inquisition. And the thing is, will those weeds be pulled, turned under, taken out of the garden? But here's the thing. A lot of gardeners burn weeds because otherwise the seeds, you know, stick around. So that whole burning at the stake is kind of this big global gardening. This time, it feels it needs to happen differently. There's more of a dignity and difference. Like, you know, like you said, the salt of the earth people, you wouldn't agree with, with half of these people who were so far right but they they kept you alive in vietnam Absolutely. and so you respect their not th their position but the fact that they are entitled and are naturally should have their perspective and not be pushed aside any longer um because everyone needs to hear and, and it's none of this parental oh you know little johnny or mary stop that nonsense that it's it's playing in the sandbox and sometimes noses get bloody you know i mean it's but the thing is afterwards then you go have lunch together i mean yeah. so okay, yeah I um, get into the book yeah okay so let's uh let's go and uh, jordan is going to begin uh with the first paragraph of answer to job which is is listed as paragraph 553 and that's because of its positioning within the collected works of C.G. Young. And, yes. Uh, we, have a, we have a guest here, Jordan. Uh, Mila Sandra Zerlich will be a guest. She doesn't wish to join the panel at this point. Oh, good to have you. And good to have honor, you, Sandra. In honor of actually beginning answer to Job now, I'm going to change my background. Uh, okay. Uh, and... <laughs> Yes, page uh, paragraph 553 is prefaced by a single um, excerpt from 2 Samuel um, verse uh, 2 Samuel 1 verse 26 and it is I am distressed for thee my brother so as we begin here in the lectori benevolo or benevolo paragraph 553 
on account of its somewhat unusual content, my little book requires a short preface. I beg of you, dear reader, not to overlook it. For in what follows, I shall speak of the venerable objects of religious belief. Whoever talks of such matters inevitably runs the risk of being torn to pieces by the two parties who are in mortal conflict about these, those very things. This conflict is due to the strange supposition that a thing is true only if it presents itself as a physical fact. Thus, some people believe it to be physically true that Christ was born as the son of a virgin, while others deny this as a physical impossibility. Everyone can see that there is no logical solution to this conflict and that one would do better not to get involved in such sterile d- disputes. Both are right and both are wrong. Yet they could easily reach agreement if, they, if only they dropped the word physical, in quotes, in open quote, physical, close quote, is not the only criterion of truth. There are also psychic truths which can neither be explained nor proved nor contested in any physical way. If, for instance, a general belief existed that the river Rhine had at one time flowed backwards from its mouth to its source, then this belief would in itself be a fact, even though such an assertion, physically understood, would be deemed utterly incredible. Beliefs of this kind are psychic facts which cannot be contested and need no proof. And I, th- I would add right there at the end, I think there's a mistranslation because it would feel in context that um, if the Rhine had one time flowed backwards from its mouth to its source, then this belief would in itself be a fact, even though such an assertion physically understood would be deemed utterly, I would tra- change the word incredible to incredulous. And it feels that That incredible word is almost like a, I mean, this is an older version. There was an autocorrect, but bad translations are autocorrect in a way. The (laughs) assumption of incredible. I see it feels like incredulous should be there, which is, you know, beyond trust and untrustworthy. So, um, and so I think key there, beliefs of this kind are psychic facts, which cannot be contested and need no proof. Yeah. And uh, this is a theme that goes through the entire, the entirety of uh, Answer to Job. And uh, to prove it all, um, go back here to um, paragraph uh, 751. Um, and he says, um, People overlook, this is in paragraph 751, so it's nearly 200 paragraphs later in this book. People overlook or seem unable to understand is the fact that I regard the psyche as real. They believe only in physical facts and must consequently come to the conclusion that either the uranium itself or the laboratory equipment created the atom bomb. This is no lot less absurd then the assumption that a non-real psyche is responsible for it. God is an obvious psychic and non-physical fact, i.e. a fact that can be established psychically, but not physically. Equally, these people have still not got it into their heads that the psychology of religion falls into two categories, which must be sharply distinguished from one another. Firstly, the psychology of the religious person, and secondly, the psychology of religion proper, i.e., of religious contents. Um, and uh, then in paragraph 752, and I, I'll do this throughout this process because the, these are they interleave, concept. they dovetail yeah. really well. Yeah. It does not matter at all that a physically impossible fact is asserted because all religious assertions are physical impossibilities. Now, when I first read this, I had to come back and read this page multiple times, but this is what he he wrote. It does not matter at all that a physically impossible fact is asserted because all religious assertions are physical impossibilities. 
If they were not so, they would, as I said earlier, necessarily be treated in the textbooks of natural science. But religious statements without exception have to do with the reality of the psyche and not with the reality of the physis. Okay, so. With that too, I'll read dovetail back into the text. The last sentence of the paragraph 153 Beliefs of this kind are psychic facts which cannot be contested and need no proof. And I've heard countless ad infinitum ad nauseum arguments that, oh, look at that. Jung is trying just to get us to sit back and listen and, you know, play, play dumb, play dead. He's not going to prove anything. He's trying to take the lazy, easy way out. And he's not, because what I feel here is this is a more mature, discussive way, rather than a philosophical, show your mama your art should go in the refrigerator philosophy way, where you're trying to prove, show your work, explain yourself. There's, you know, the old concept, don't tell people your next move, don't tell people about money. I mean, it's, it's the kind of thing where there's an adult unsupervised you are driving your own situation you don't need to prove to yourself you don't need to believe it's your deep knowing so i think that people often cherry pick whether they try to attack the substance or beliefs of this kind or psychic facts which cannot be contested and need no proof at that point then they pick on his alleged philosophical superficiality and transparency when in reality that's the surface of a deeper substantial statement. Yeah, I, mean, I want to go to the some of the comments that are here, but excellent. Uh, I, I wanted to add that um, the issue of belief is um, is is certainly an issue in religious discourse, and. Um, the point that Jung made throughout his career is that you have to have your own experience. Okay. If you're, if you're right. believing, then you're believing someone else's experience and all mm -hmm. religions are originally based on a numinous experience from someone long ago, typically. Um, right. And, uh, and people often suggest that, Jung was attempting to create a new religion, and that's not true at all. Uh, he was only trying to uh, recast actual religions in, in a, a different, somewhat different perspective, a different mold, and that different mm -hmm. mold applies to all religions. Now, um, and also that living, living directly by the Bible is a superficial mode of living it may be good practice but the problem is then the bible becomes your parent you're trans transferring who's in control to this narrative biography that's the most grammatically correct book on the planet because it's been edited so many times yeah. um but it's the kind of thing where then you're not living your life you're practicing the play in front of the pta of this is what the bible says well, it's not that it takes originality out. It's what do you have to contribute by the actions that your life, your play plays out with this as, as a reflex or this as um, simply a script. But then how does your life go off, off the script of, say, this, call it a spine? I mean, it's a hidden support. And that originality is, I think, I find it requisite and it's required. Right. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> sorry, um, Mill brings up an interesting point here. Um, I'm going to leave out her personal relationship to Jung, but she says, I wonder if Jung was a fan of Leonardo da Vinci, and I'd love to learn more about the two in connection. If you have any recommendations for literary or the uh, literature on the similarities of philosophy or the human condition, please nudge me into that direction. And it so happens that um, I have it on my desk. Yes, 
Um, that was quick. <laughs> yeah. And I have it on my desk because um, Jordan gave me uh, the third volume in this edition, which is um, uh, a series of three, three volumes of essays by Eric Neumann, who was regarded as the leading student of C.G. Jung. And, um, and the very first essay, I think it's the first and the second essays of this book uh, are, and, and this is the book, uh, it's called um, uh, Art and the Creative Unconscious by, or Creative Unconscious by Eric Neumann. And the first essay is called Leonardo and the Mother Archetype. Uh, and so that is, covered in detail in this book, Art and the Creative Unconscious by Eric Neumann. And uh, we are going to be studying this three volume series about creativity uh, in our advanced reading group, which meets on uh, Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern time in the US. So it would be evening time if you happen to live in Europe. Um, and so, uh, if, if, um, uh, it'd be wonderful to have some more participants in the group. We do have a very active uh, advanced reading group. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, so for, I would say beginning in February through June, we'll be discussing Neumann's, uh, essays, which are carried in these uh, three volumes that, uh, Jordan brought to my attention at Christmas time, and uh, they seem very important because we're understanding, um, you know, a key aspect of Jungian psychology, which is that um, Jung, you know, it's all, it, it can all be summed up in one sentence, which is in this book, Liberation of the Heart by Lawrence Jaffe. Uh, Lawrence was uh, the son of Aniela Jaffe. And um, he says this, the purpose of Jung's whole psychology is to make accessible to us that healing power, which resides in our unconscious. So I'll read that again, because that sentence sums up everything about Jungian psychology, and it definitely sums up what we will be doing at our um, confluence in um, June. So here it is again. The purpose of Jung's whole psychology is to make accessible to us that healing power which resides in our unconscious. Now, why is this relevant? It's relevant because uh, when you're doing an art of any kind or when you are creating anything, it can be creating dinner for your kids. Um, when you're creating anything, um, or as Jordan does, Jordan reads tarot cards in uh, Taos, New Mexico, and he is creating a temenos, which is a way of opening uh, the unconscious. And what we will be doing in Helena, Montana in June is we are going to do four days together where we are opening uh, the unconscious. We're opening our unconscious uh, to the people who participate there. And they in turn will be uh, opening their unconscious and uh, Jordan and I open our unconscious every day uh, that mm -hmm. we're here on Sunday morning where we um, are talking about things in our lives and how these paragraphs apply to us. And uh, I had no idea that I'd be talking about Kodiak, for example, this morning. Uh, it, right. just, it came directly from my unconscious. And it is because it has a healing effect on me, certainly. And I offer it as a way for you to get access to your unconscious. That's what we're talking about here. Um, 
And yes. I think to, to add, I appreciate you recommending the Eric Neumann books in regards to um, her request for, you know, books about Einstein and Jung that, that would be indirect, but at the same time, along those same lines, again, not Einstein and Jung are not, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself, not um, Da Vinci and Jung, but there's a book that I read, I think in right around 2000, 2001, called maybe a little later, Einstein, Einstein's Space and Van Gogh's Sky. And it, it use, may use the word reductionism a little too many times, if I remember correctly. <laughs> I, 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 I told people that there, there should be a drinking game made with, because you would, if you use that word, you'd lose. I mean, just because it's going to be every, every four, four sessions uh, mm -hmm. or every four sentences. But Einstein's Space and Van Gogh's Sky is another one that I found to be overall conceptually really nice in terms of contrasting these um, two things. I mean, Van Gogh was very, very thoughtful and then expressive thoughtfully in his paintings. And Einstein was very, very concrete in his formulas about abstract things, allegedly abstract, because there's a both and, I think, with both of them. And Einstein was very much about his imagination. And, and more than his work, I think he would prefer to hang out with his wife and play violin. Yeah. Um, so what I'm putting on the chats right now is uh, the link uh, to join our advanced reading group if you have interest. And um, put that down in YouTube, and then I'm also going to include um, um, the Confluence information, confluence22.org. Um, and uh, I'll leave that for uh, Amelia as well. Uh, Okay, so uh, I urge you to uh, put your name in if you're thinking of coming to the confluence in June so that you save a space. It's, a, it's going to be a meeting by invitation only. Uh, Jordan will be there and um, several uh, of other uh, organizers will be there. We're going to make it a remarkable se session where we will be giving you access to your own unconscious and showing you how to do it. It will be a numinous event, I promise you that. Um, and uh, okay, so going back to some of the con comments, comments on, right. on YouTube, Justin said uh, the Webb Space Telescope won't be able to look that far back because the universe was not transparent in the beginning. It was also not lighted up, I believe. So anyway, um, it, it can look back to 200 million years, I guess, after the Big Bang. Uh, but that's quite a bit farther than we've looked so far. Uh, Chris Newton asked, could, could you elaborate on Jung's father complex? I feel as though it's incredibly important to his this work. Um, well, well, what I can say about Jung's father complex, because all, really his creative, his collected works are all about that. So uh, that would be a, a bridge too far. But uh, I just say that Jung was, was uh, descended from uh, six generations of Protestant pastors. And uh, he, therefore he was raised in the um, in the midst of church uh, in every respect his father was a pastor and one of the things that he noted was that when he took his own um, first communion and um, you know his entry into the church nothing happened there was no numinous experience for him and that, immediately got him to question what his father and all his uh, paternal ancestors had been about and 
he was in that right up to the end and including an answer to Joe. And it was mm-hmm. explaining, he was explaining that because the fact that he was not moved by his own um, joining of the church said to him, uh, oh my God, what are these people doing? <laughs> you know, what's this all about? Mm-hmm. And of course, it's the same problem that we all have uh, in the 20th century, if if we uh, try to follow the people who want us to believe in in magic um, and who don't want to point to the God within, but but are talking about an external God who has agency and can magically make uh, you know give us a nice birthday cake tomorrow, <laughs> whatever it is that, that yeah. We might- yeah we might want uh that god does not exist and never has the and, adult version of santa claus right and right and so i guess i'll leave it at that for the father complex but you might want to read memory streams reflections if you haven't done this mm-hmm. um, okay now, i do Josh think was, too though he I, I do think in regards to the father complex though um Jung clearly shows what an unresolved complex that's really worked with actionably cannot be a a diminishment of life. So a lot of people with father complexes tend to explain way too much, tend to prove, 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 always like, you know, look at me, watch me dive, watch me dive. It's it's a lot of the approval piece, but Jung Mm. really had the larger father complex of the capital F, Father, God, divine also with that so that it wasn't just limited to his dad and his lineage it was very much he wanted to be clear logos level clear uh, to the point of scientific with the poetic notions and concepts he was playing with so in that sense i think when we say father complex there's a we couldn't have young without it and and, so there needs opening to to actually support what his own psychology was rather than play the scar and the bird with the broken wing that i somehow need to heal that it's no i'm gonna use that right and and you know i think everybody has thought their father was wrong at some point in time okay and you know and plenty of people get into fights with their parents and their fathers and um, and what Jung was doing, basically, he was had realized by the time he was 11 and he had his uh, dream about the Cathedral of Basel, um, he was realizing that that a lot of what his father had been teaching him was wrong and he needed in his psyche he needed to get his mind around that and so he did that uh and he spent his whole life doing it actually so and an and answer, what I think, answer to job yeah. is the culmination of that go ahead yeah and i don't think he lives his life still in his dad's shadow i mean he he got out of his dad's shadow pretty quickly i mean and that's one thing about if you have a strong dad or father figure there's a lot of times i mean even your friends close to you will say wow you finally got out of that long shadow of your dad into the light and it wasn't that the dad was bad it's just that when the figure is that powerful and that well versed even in what they're doing the imitation can go on way too long and you end up spinning yourself around and getting lost instead of going out into the sun on your own. Right. So uh, Joshua says, answer to Job is very much an assessment on some spiritual first principles. I find the apostle Paul to be in alignment with Jung in um, in some subtle ways that are very interesting and contrary to traditional Christianity. Mm -hmm. Well, Joshua, I would say that it's not, subtle at all because the last paragraph of answer to job paragraph 758 he's explicitly talking about the apostle paul Mm -hmm. and um 
let's see. Um, yeah, Paul was Paul yeah, was let, unique for the for the books, which yeah, was, so for the, for these purposes to answer Chris's yeah. question and to show how explicit this is, it's not subtle at all. Uh, I'll just read the last ten lines of answer to Job, which are. In these circumstances, it is well to remind ourselves of St. Paul and his split consciousness. On one side, he felt he was the apostle directly called and enlightened by God. And on the other side, a sinful man who could not pluck out the thorn in the flesh and rid himself of the satanic angel who plagued him. That is to say, even the enlightened person remains what he is and is never more than his own limited ego before the one who dwells within him, whose form has no knowable boundaries, who encompasses him on all sides, fathomless as the abysms of the earth and vast as the sky. So, you know, your point is very well taken, Joshua. Yeah. And, and, you, and I would say it's, it's not subtle, but it is certainly wonderfully nuanced. And so I think that's that kind of could kind of crack open the word subtle there to then hatch into the, the nuances there of the both and the living with both sides as one. But they don't make mud. You know, they they integrate in a dignity and difference back and forth, side to side. I mean, frankly, Fred Astaire, Ginger Rogers kind of way, you know. So um, Chris says, Sonarshan Dasani said to me that quote, the psyche is real, unquote, is a mistranslation. Rather, he would like to translate the real to actual in that it acts on the individual and vice versa. Okay, so uh, Shamsani would like to say the psyche is actual, okay, and it activates, okay. So then Kathy says, did I say that the adult reading group is on Mondays? Uh, I did, if I said that, I did not mean that. Uh, the uh, the advanced reading group, uh, the ARG, uh, the advanced reading group is on Wednesday at 1 p.m. U.S. Eastern time. Um, and um, that time allows it to reach all the way from um, Hawaii on the west to uh, Western Europe and India on the east. Uh, you know, it's interesting with Sean, Sean Dasani's um, call for a retranslation of the word real to be actual. I think that's apt, but I think it's also historically generational because real at Jung's time would indicate alive there in front of you, able to influence you. You could pick it up, see it, think about it in any number of ways. But actual now would then speak to the current mode of people trying to distinguish way too much. Is that scientific? Is that artistic? Is there a difference? Aren't they just the reverse of one another? One's inside out. Um, but it's interesting to me, the word actual with act, um, that seems a little tricky because um, even though the three letters ACT are in the front, um, actual simply just means present or, or actually true. Mm -hmm. So I, I appreciate that that word would, you know, be put in there, but I would actually put both words in there and then as an etymology to not explain how it came, but then give the original meanings of both words and let the reader decide. Right. Okay, now uh, Joshua goes on and says, uh, let me see. Um, Jung makes such an excellent point about spiritual experience. The Old Testament spoke of when spiritual experience would serve as the means of spiritual obedience, putting commandments in our hearts. Uh, it's a shame the mystery of the Bible is reduced to d a dead tradition. Uh, well, I would I just like to amplify on that that the a religious experience is a numinous experience, and um, 
you know, I've gotten to the point in my own life where I have numinous experiences every day, multiple times a day, very often. And um, they often come from synchronicities, but uh, human beings 3,500 years ago didn't have any context to th even think about that. And so um, Edinger breaks down the, the periods of, um, of religious thought first as uh, the period of the law, the Ten Commandments, uh, which lasted from the time of Moses down to the time of Christ. Uh, then the period of belief, which began with um, the birth of Christ. And I'm not talking about the physical birth of Christ, but mm -hmm. actually the birth of uh, the Christian religion, whenever that really happened. And, uh, it, I think we have to be careful to, just to respond to the comment. I mean, not careful and respond to the comment, but careful with the word obedience. Because in those times, the word obeisance would actually be more appropriately put in. And we don't have that word in our vocabulary much anymore. And obeisance, obeisance is simply, I mean, it's O-B-E-I-S-A-N-C-E, -E, is deferential respect. And right. that's a dignity and difference that would be present with, say, a curtsy or a bow. Uh, it's, or, it's a matter of a way of saying mahalo or yeah. shalom or hello or and namaste. hi or yeah. namaste. And yeah. I think that obeisance piece, that's where namaste and mahalo and shalom, all those occur now, but they're as if they're in different cultures. But right. it's all a version of obeisance, which wasn't obedience. It wasn't bowing in front and kneeling. It was simply bowing or making a curtsy, yeah. which is just a hello, yeah. I'm here. We're going to change the chapter to we're both here. Um, yeah, it's it's uh, recogni recognition of the divinity and the other. Not yeah, saying that you too are divine. You, you have a piece of divinity as well, but you're showing respect to the divinity and the other. Um, and it makes a pause in the action that highlights this piece as the present tense and what's going on now. Even two fighters... Yeah. You know, we're going to bow to each other or touch hands. I mean, there's a, we are now leaving what was before. We are now right. entering this place. Right. And so I would put that, that leaving point, you know, it was happening for 500 years with the right. scientific method, but it, it sort of was punctuated at the time of Nietzsche. And then the third age of religion is what Jung presented, which is um, to understand all these things that have happened in all the religions of the world in a psychological context. Then they're all true. Then right. they're hundred percent true and you don't have to get into a fight about it. Uh, and that, I think yeah. that's significant. Okay, and I well, think that Jordan, the, we've gotten through one. one I was going to say, I was just thinking the same thing, Skip, that, you know, we did really well. We've gotten through one paragraph and like just under an hour and a half. This is going to be I'm really glad you brought this book up because it's it's going to be a kind of a miracle growth garden. It'll be a it'll, well, this first paragraph, you know, is sort of the zinger because it really yeah. contains everything in it. But um and this discussion has really already contained everything in it because as uh, Joshua uh, pointed out about, uh, about St. Paul, uh, this book begins and ends with, with these ideas. And uh, like we casted out wildflower seed, right. you know, and we're going to so get gonna, them all. <laughs> we're going to talk about it again, uh, multiple times, I'm sure. But um and Kathy says, uh, Jordan, thank you for the wonderful quote, new to me, unquote, word. Okay. Which, which of the quotes was that? Uh, I don't know what, she, what she's referring to. I thought You're you welcome. might know. <laughs> You're welcome. Well, and it, once I say what? something, sometimes it's, I just have said it for the first time. Yeah. So you're welcome. I'm well, glad here, it's something resonated. Here, here, here's what I've found after doing this now for nearly six years. In June, I'll be getting my 
seventh year of, of my work here. And um, I, what I found is that I am opening my psyche. Okay, every time I do a session with mm -hmm. any of the groups, um, I'm opening my psyche to others, which means that um, when, when we close it off at the end, I have no idea, not a clue what I've really talked about. I mean, I, in terms of the you know, first hour and 20 minutes of today's session, I do remember that we talked about Kodiak, but yeah. nothing else. <laughs> and so, so, you know, that's a sign that this is, I'm, I'm bringing it, I'm bringing it from my personal unconscious and I'm giving you, the listener, uh, the opportunity and, and Jordan is doing that too. And so mm -hmm. um, we're, we're, giving you the listener the opportunity to interact with that unconscious and to see that flow and to see what's going on and um you know that's the point of the sentence from yafe which is that you can feel healed and this is the thing that i wasn't understanding when i was 30 and i, I was a deacon of the reformed church in greece new york and I, I couldn't say why, but when I'd leave church on a Sunday, I would feel better. And I mm -hmm. didn't know why. And the reason why is because a church service does open up your psyche in a certain way. And, and it gives access to this healing power that we all need in order to face our lives. And so I'll just read Yafe's sentence again. The purpose of Jung's whole psychology is to make accessible to us that healing power, which resides in our unconscious. And that's what we're doing here. That's what every theologian of every stripe is doing during a service. They're um, making accessible uh, the healing power. And so we have to get beyond this whole idea of, you know, his way of doing it is right and my, or his way is wrong and mine is right. That's not true. Um, what is true is that they all work. And, mm -hmm. and, um, and so we've, we've, um, we've tapped into something here that's extremely powerful and on the on the confluence issue our organizational group that met in california in november and we're going to meet again in early march um what we realized is that we put together six individuals and a few others who were helping us, but six individuals who were organizing our confluence for June, who all have very unique experiences, but they all uh, are this high voltage relationship with the unconscious. It's a mm -hmm. very high voltage relationship with the unconscious. And we braided those six together and oh my God, it was so incredibly numinous even for us and we walked away from it all of us and we said wow what just happened <laughs> and and we didn't even know that that's what we were going to be do doing in the mm -hmm. confluence when we met on november 4th i mean we we knew that we each had a contribution to make but we didn't know um what it is, but it is the realization that you, you bring this all together. And, you know, when we say invitation only for our confluence, you know, we are bringing together people uh, like Jordan Hoggard and many others who uh, all have something to give. Okay. It's not just the six of us. It's not us. We're not going to get up there and and uh, lecture, we're going to give you experiences that are going to be profound. And 
when you pull all of that together and braid uh, 40 people together, because it's 10, you know, 10 people involved in organization and 30 uh, guests, and all of those are by invitation, all of a sudden we have something that is truly high voltage that's going to happen uh, this summer. And uh, we, we definitely can't wait for it to happen. Well, and I, I will, I'm not to just pretty much parrot and say ditto, parrot everything you just said, but um, this happens in almost, I and mean, from my perspective, um, I don't sit around and study all week as to what I'm going to say and present and practice and to me, I, I have business and work to do. And so to me, I, I really love that since I think my early 20s, I just would sight read situations. And to me, it's like throwing me in battle and here, point the boat and succeed in the mission. And that's all the instruction you're given. And yep. you have to make your own mission. And and get back home, so to speak. And I think that's what I really love about these Sunday mornings, where typically it's you know you and I and or Idris has stopped by too, um, is that we kind of get into the sailboat, we set the sail, and let the wind start us out. And every once in a while, one of us will look up and then no, nah, we need to take the jib attack and go into the wind, and and then we sit back down and we continue talking. I mean, so it's as if we're we move by sight reading and it's interesting that we, I think we, in a big picture, we both do that. And I think that's one of the reasons I, I love Sunday mornings here so much is because I don't know what I'm going to get or give. I don't know what you're going to get or give. And the alchemy of it is set something in motion. And right. we, we may start somewhere very specifically, but all that says is, well, we know where we started, but we still don't know where we're going. Yeah. And so, so I'll tell I'll t add one more comment from uh, YouTube and then we'll go to the next paragraph. So, the next paragraph. <laughs> right. so Kathy uh, says, I teach Pilates and often go into a deep current and flow of spontaneous creativity in my delivery. Time disappears and souls are at play. Very definitely, Kathy. That's exactly what we're talking about, and that's wonderfully and, said. And yes, perfectly said. And and um, uh, yeah. So let us go on. I'll, I'll read the next chapter, the next paragraph, since you read the first one. And you, uh, if I would suggest you read the last sentence of the previous, because he refers to it in the first sentence of five fifty four as a okay. relationship. Right. Okay, so the last sentence of 553 and mind you this is the first where this is the last sentence of the very first paragraph of answer to job now is beliefs of this kind are psychic facts which cannot be contested and need no proof that's critical okay paragraph 554 religious statements are of this type they refer without exception to things that cannot be established as physical facts. If they did not do this, they would inevitably fall into the category of the natural sciences. Taken as referring to anything physical, they make no sense whatever, and science would dismiss them as non-experienceable. They would be mere miracles, which are sufficiently exposed to doubt as it is, and yet they could not demonstrate the reality of the spirit or meaning that underlies them because meaning is something that always demonstrates itself and is experienced on its own merits. The spirit and meaning of Christ are present and perceptible to us even without the aid of miracles. Miracles appear, appeal only to the understanding of those who cannot perceive the meaning. They are mere substitutes for the not understood reality of the spirit. This is not to say that the living presence of the spirit is not occasionally accompanied by a marvelous physical by marvelous physical happenings. And I only wish to emphasize that these happenings can neither replace nor bring about an understanding of the spirit 
which is the one essential thing. Okay, now this put in, in my mind one miracle that has been important in my life and um, it's important in everyone's life and that's, that's our mortality. And um, uh, you know, there's been a <coughs> there's been a, <coughs> there's been a conflict in my uh, family about the mortal about the miracle of Lazarus coming back to life in the Bible, and uh, at least in her youth, one of my daughters wanted to believe that Jesus's friend Lazarus had physically gotten up and walked out of the place uh, in the scientific method sense. Uh, <clears throat> and so she had to believe in that miracle at that time, um, at that time in her own development. And what I have learned from seeing the death of my own parents and uh, my wife's parents and many other deaths in my relationships with others um, is that they don't die, okay? And, and this is the point that Jesus made with Lazarus, which was um, he went into the house where Mary and Martha uh, were and where Lazarus's body was stretched out on the table and um, he when he came out the two women uh, testified that he had brought Lazarus back to life and surely he did but what he pointed out to them no doubt um, in my mind and is that um, Lazarus had not changed one bit in their hearts, okay? In other words, mm -hmm. yes, this physical body, which once had animation, uh, was Lazarus, but the, the part of Lazarus that is, was meaningful to them and is meaningful to us today is the part that was in their hearts during his physical lifetime and was still there and unchanged, unchanged after his physical death. Mm -hmm. And that is the, that's the point of all religion. It's the point of immortality and, you know, al almost everything that we search religion for, which is that you carry your um, the, your deceased ancestors with you, okay? You are the result of millions of ancestors that have done two things successfully. They survived until they reproduced. <clears throat> and that goes back to your ancestors that were single-celled organisms all the way back to that. They survived until they reproduced. And if you go through all the generations of your family line, you will find that all of your ancestors did that. They survived until they reproduced and you are the fulfillment of what they were re reproducing for. It's you. And so all of us without kids are still immortal. Assuredly. <laughs> well, <we're> and, <laughs> I won't have kids till I'm Yoda's age. It's like and you're immortal um, in another way, and that is simply these videos will never <laughs> die. <laughs> right, right. I, I think it Kathy's statement about time goes away really struck me, really landed, because I remember um, saying when I was painting, whether it was oil or watercolor that time dilated at the, those points. Time dilated so big and so there, I couldn't see it anymore. And so literally literally that opening up 
where that intersection of discipline and surrender equals flow. Um, I really like the way that Kathy put that in the comment of how she experiences that in Pilates. And then she basically stands and delivers, you know, yeah. just sight read. Right. And I, and uh, Kathy is one who I'm expecting to be with us in Helena. And I'm sure she will bring that experience with her. Um, so we have to, so the point is the essential thing that we need is to understand what the spirit is and, and, yeah. and understand the d distinction between a spirit of God and the spirit of the devil. And uh, so anyway, um, you want to read the next paragraph? Certainly. Paragraph 555. <clears throat> the fact that religious statements frequently conflict with the observed physical phenomenon proves that in contrast to physical perception, the spirit is autonomous. And that psychic experience is to a certain extent independent of physical data. The psyche is an autonomous factor and religious statements are psychic confessions, which in the last resort are based on unconscious, i.e. in essence, on transcendental, transcendental processes. These processes are not accessible to the physical perception, but demonstrate their existence through the confessions of the psyche. The resultant statements are filtered through the medium of human consciousness. That is to say, they are given visible forms in which their, in which their turn are subject to manifold influences from within and without. That is why whenever we speak of religious contents, we move in a world of images that point to something ineffable. We do not know how to clear or unclear these images, metaphors, and concepts. These images, metaphors, and concepts are in respect of their transcendental object. Let me read that again. I don't think I'm getting the rhythm right. We do not know how clear or unclear these images, metaphors, and concepts are in respect of their transcendental object. There we go. If, for instance, we say God, we give expression to an image or verbal concept, which has undergone many changes in the course of time. We are, however, unable to say with any degree of certainty, unless it be by faith, whether these changes affect only the images and concepts or the unspeakable, capital U, unspeakable itself, refer back to ineffable, ineffable, after all, we can imagine God as an externally flowing current of vital energy that endlessly changes shape just as easily as we can imagine him as an eternally unmoved, unchangeable essence. Our reason is sure only of one thing, that it manipulates images and ideas which are dependent on human imagination and its temporal and local lost my place here, um, and ideas which are dependent on human imagination and its temporal and local conditions, and which have therefore changed innumerable times in the course of their long history. There is no doubt that there is something behind these images that transcends consciousness and operates in such a way that the statements do not vary limitlessly and chaotically but clearly all relate to a few basic principles or archetypes. These, like the psyche itself, or like matter, are unknowable as such. All we can do is to construct models of them, which we know to be inadequate, a fact which is confirmed again and again and, ag and again by religious statements. Right. Thoughts, comments? Um, well, what I was thinking of during this was a couple of things. Um, one was Notre Dame mm. and, and the burning of Notre Dame a right. couple of years back um, because I'm not a Catholic um, but I have visited Notre Dame. I wanted to visit it. I don't know why I wanted to visit it um, but I did want to visit it. And um, 
when I visited Notre Dame, I wasn't particularly moved at, at that time. I, I thought there was nice art there, but it, it didn't move me in a, in a spiritual sense per se. Uh, and that's probably because I wasn't raised in the Catholic church. Um, and I find our Cathedral of the Navy, which is the Naval Academy Chapel here in Annapolis, um, much more moving. All I, all I have to do is think of it and, and that moves me. But when Notre Dame um, burned, I wept uncontrollably. I mean, when I turned on the television and saw what was happening, uh, I wept and for about, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes before I could get hold of myself. And I didn't really understand why. And that evening I had a class, the regular one uh, Monday night basic class that I teach at eight on Monday evenings. And um, I, I gave the, that discussion that night over to Notre Dame. And I couldn't say a word for the first 10 minutes. I just showed photographs of uh, or screenshots that I had pulled off my computer. Um, and um, the reason I'm mentioning this is because I'm now realizing in the fullness of time that everything that we see spread upon the earth is the result of our collective unconscious, of our human collective unconscious, and therefore of, you know, an emanation of God. And certainly um, Notre Dame is, um, is a powerful, powerful symbol of, of that. And so, You know, God uh, has presented everything that we see in the world in a specific way that is today. It's, it's today. And it isn't something that happened 3,500 years ago. It's when you walk in to the grocery store and you can go up and down the aisles and pick, choose your food and go and check out and nobody bothers you. Um, and that's typically true the world over, regardless of race, color, or creed. Okay, in other words, I've been in many countries of the world, um, Muslim countries uh, and Buddhist countries and uh, Jain countries and so on. And, um, you know, pretty much everybody just goes and uh, buys their food the same way <laughs> and checks out. And, um, and so, you know, that is also God's will, okay? That, you know, we have as a species adopted that way of being in the world. Maybe we don't know it, we don't understand it, um, but that's the way it is. And at the same time, uh, on the other side of that is um, the George Floyd murder uh, two summers ago when, and we get, keep getting repeated. It gets repeating, repeated on our television screens almost daily since then. And that is also us. Okay. That is, that is also our, collective unconscious and and so now we have to develop to the next stage of consciousness we were at a stage of consciousness during the 20th century when we all had our borders and had to protect them and and, um, and that's the way we came up from our first ancestors from our single-celled organism ancestors but now it's time that we realize that, as Carl Sagan had it, we all live on this pale blue dot, and we're going to have to figure out how to do that. And uh, I'll, I'll pull up an image of the pale blue dot here in a moment. Uh, well, and that reminds me, this 
this paragraph and what you were saying to stay in line with that with Notre Dame. Uh, I was there in 1989. And I remember, you know, from that perspective, I was just about to enter into my thesis uh, programming and my thesis the next year, but this was May of 89. Um, and I remember when I walked in, my stepmother said, and she pointed to the rose window, she said, and that is why they call it the voice of God in light. But what's interesting is all of a sudden there was just this hush you could feel go over the whole cathedral and the choir started singing. The thing is they were doing a rehearsal, but a full dress song, no abridgment rehearsal. The thing is I immediately got tingles. I noticed, Oh, and that's the sound of God in voice. But the thing is you couldn't see them. The, the choir is up above you behind you rather than if you look at the medico scientific architectural evolution of the church, you see your friends and family up behind the pulpit in the choir singing. So it, it makes it seen. It makes it scientific. It makes it, I can grok that, that I see instead of just this cascading sound yeah. that's resonating with you as you experience the colorful light of the stained glass in front of you. So literally seeing the unseen while you're feeling what you can. And I, I find it interesting that growing up the Methodist church I was in, we had the choir up on either side of the pulpit, but there also was the traditional choir up above you. And those times when they would utilize that and you were just staring at an empty altar there was such an amazing experience about the ineffable and the unseen, but that you were really actually visually, viscerally experiencing. So it, I, I know when I saw, when I saw Notre Dame burning, um, it took a while for a couple of tears to start dropping, but I literally was stunned. I, right. it was I had to cycle through in my mind the milestone and the moment of history I'm experiencing, you know, all these newscasters, you know, in my head of where I was until I got to the feeling. So I realized how much information was just hanging out over that. Right. I, I just need to interrupt for a second, uh, Jordan, because uh, Amila has asked, uh, uh, she said, uh, I look forward to the Nyman reading. Where can I sign up for the reading group? And the answer to mm. that, if, if you look higher, if you scroll down on the chat, uh, you'll find the, the link for the MailChimp mailing list. So I send out notices a few minutes before every session so that people have the links conveniently. But uh, if you sign up on the mailing list uh, as appropriate, uh, and this link also appears on the YouTube chat. I just, I don't have it handy right this second. Let's see if I. I'm do. glad. Thanks for the interruption. Oh. I just noticed on our chat here that she had asked her last day where she's right. staying uh, to go out and enjoy the day. So um, yeah, um, good. So I'm she gonna, can get that. Yeah, I'm gonna just uh, I put the link back on, and I'll put the link back on uh, YouTube. So so that you can find that. Okay, all right, so let us, uh, I think we've probably done what we can do with that one. Um, I, I don't think we can get through this introduction to answer to Joe. <laughs> no, and the next, yeah, the next paragraph too has, you know, a testimonial, a testimonial quote also. So it's, it's, pretty, it's a pretty robust paragraph with yeah. some juicy, chocolate filling yeah. you know so let, let me let me say we're going to put that off until next week and uh i'll just repeat what the what the mission is here now and that is that you know some years ago i read answer to job and you can hear my reading of it on this youtube channel there is a playlist um that contains all of my readings of the all of the paragraphs but 
Um, I think I did that in 2017, but I did not put much commentary in it. I mainly just read the book. And so if you want to just read the book or have a book on tape of it uh, or on recording of it, just go to that playlist and you can just listen to me read it right through. Um, and uh, you know, with, uh, with the exception of um, one paragraph, I think, which is 746, 747, two paragraphs where mm -hmm. I had a numinous moment happen in the middle of my reading. And, uh, uh, and so that is, is there, but otherwise you can just have a, an audio version of Answer to Job and just listen to it. What our purpose here over the next few months is going to be to provide a commentary on Answer to Job. Mm -hmm. And so what we've done today is only provide the introduction uh, to the 2010 edition. Um, and we're in uh, Dr. Jung's own introductory remarks before we really get into the meat of it. And which he insisted that people needed to read in order to appreciate what he was saying. Right. And, and of course, in, the, in this context, in this introduction, he's really covered a lot of the high points of Jungian psychology. And as I pointed out, um, these early high points also relate to the end of the book. And these are very common things which come up, which interestingly, Joshua uh, had raised the issue of St. Paul. And, and of course, uh, St. Paul appears in the last 10 lines of the book. Yeah, directly relates. And I, right. I think that I'm glad when, when Joshua brought up St. Paul, um, same thing here with Jung and this, that's, I think, I'm glad you pulled this out for us to do because in modern society, you know, you hear a lot of people talk about, oh, but the chaos, oh, but the chaos. Well, that's called capital in nature. That's never changed. <clears throat> but there yeah. is a how to get synchronous, not synchronicity, but how so much to get synchronized with your own resonance, with also the chatter weather patterns of what's outside to actually live relatively eloquently and gracefully in the chaos, not as a spectator or not only in the eye of the storm looking out over it where you're literally able to not, it's like I, what comes to mind is, you know, the barracks, the dorm barracks where you have all these people and at every turn they're yelling out and screaming and it's, you get to the deafening silence of battle where there comes a point where you come to clarity you no, know, regardless of how you know chaotic the circumstances are, so it's not all hearts and flowers, and it's not all easy. And I think what's nice about this is with Jung getting messy here, getting his hands dirty, he still got the hammer and the safety glasses working on that stone. You know, there's yeah, a, yeah. there's a there's a certain grace in just the efforts, and um, in actually being honest with how complex the topic of simply facing the demons and the angels or facing the good and the bad actually is in life. Yeah. And getting to the point, I, the movie Gladiator comes to mind where, you know, death smiles at us all. All we can do is smile back. And, you know, my joke to that is, well, life is fatal. <laughs> Life is fatal, yeah. <laughs> so, so you might as well live it. And especially when it's when it's chaotic, it's like, oh, cool, this got interesting. Turn it up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. So uh, we'll begin with paragraph five hundred and fifty, or yeah, five fifty six. Yeah, five fifty six. Uh, next week, so you can use any version of Answer to Job, including um, uh, including any language version of Answer to Job, because uh, that way, if you are not a native English speaker, if you get your own copy in your own language, you'll know exactly what we're referring to in English, right. and, and that will make it easier for you. Uh, and I urge you to do that if you're, you know, if you're European and you, you don't speak English as a first language, um, 
please do get a copy of Answer to Job, and you will know exactly where we're reading. You can read it in your own language and then follow along in our discussion. Uh, and I'm glad we're unpacking this because I feel that Jung actually unpacked his own work. So here, even with the, my favorite long paragraphs, you know, I'm kind of the black sheep in that regard. But, <laughs> you know, even even with that, that little intellectual fetish, um, it's interesting to me here that he's taking great care to speak to the reader rather than to write down his observations and his work. So I find there's a real handshake here, um, almost even a hug, um, where this, it's like stuff just got real, you yeah, know? Sure. And he, I think he brings out an answer to Job, but it, it ends up being a precis or a synopsis of the, all the rest of the other volumes. Yeah. You know, yeah, right sure. here, I think, you know, little Al, how many licks does it take to get to the center of a Tootsie Roll Tootsie Pop? A one or two? <laughs> well, I think here is that, you know, we go, oh, yeah. look at the chocolate we found. Yeah, right. Okay. Um, so I th it's, been a, it's been an interesting discussion, I hope. Uh, we certainly have a few followers who have stuck with us throughout. Uh, I appreciate I the breadth and depth of the comments, too, today. We had some... Yeah. Good, comments, really poetic right, but, responses. Right. Thank uh, you. And uh, so, in this case, um, maybe others won't have yet found the the first reading of Answer to Job I did in 2017. But um, but you'll know it's coming for the next few months and what to come in for at this time on. Sunday morning, and thank you to Jordan for participating. He he lives in the Mountain Time Zone, and so uh, he's doing this at seven a.m. <laughs> so every every Sunday morning, I have to kneel in the ashes to get up that early. It's right. like, <laughs> yeah, no, I appreciate that. No, no, much. no. This is my pleasure. Yeah. Okay. 